Welcome to the Dev Ready Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Today, we're joined by George Mirabelli. He is from SoftLogic Solutions, where what they do is help people with their R&D processes and optimizing those within their businesses or startups, it may be, to get the best benefit out of the R&D tax claim. George, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for having me on the podcast. It's a privilege to be here. Are hey, you welcome. No problem. So, George, let's um, dig in a bit about you. Tell us a bit about your background and history. Love to share a little bit about um, our guest and uh, maybe why you're on the podcast. Sure. My background goes back a long way. I started out in air traffic control systems, designing and developing solutions for the Air Force and for Brunei and various countries around the world. Nice. Yeah. That was exciting and mm -hmm. led me into the whole area of R&D and software development and started out uh, working with the R&D tax concession and tax offset and 150% tax break, as it was called in those days, and worked my way through to working on the Jindalee radar, managing the development of the user interface and the, the console system, and then moved on to working in insurance systems, then into finance systems. I manage the team at MYOB, uh, it's 115 developers, and so worked at Integrion, which was previously in Avonix, that was about 115 staff. Uh, so I had a very long career in chemical engineering, product design, manufacturing, right through to software development as we started off in software development, and have grown up with the R&D tax incentive and, and making sure that we were always compliant and, and making the most of it. And mm. Now, for the last couple of years, I've spent my time helping businesses learn how to do that, how to really maximise the benefits of the R&D tax incentive beyond the simple fill in the, the registration and get things registered and then claim the, the tax incentive, but rather starting from the ground up, getting your processes right from the beginning and therefore not leaking potential expenses that can be claimed and making sure that you're always on a sure footing to claim the best that you can from the R&D tax incentive. And it's such a generous scheme that my mission is really to make more and more companies access it by helping them do it properly and therefore do it by just doing their job the way it needs to be done to get their R&D done, but at the same time meeting the compliance requirements um, and really trying to make it as easy as possible. Yeah, that's a good summation, George. Thanks for uh, taking us through that. Sounds like you've got quite a bit of experience on both the engineering product side, which probably gets you in good stead from advising on an R&D perspective, one would imagine, given the extent of your experience there. And also, just for our listeners, we've also done a, a podcast back in episode 19, which talked a lot about what the R&D tax incentive is. But George, can you take us just through a little bit, just a couple of minutes explaining what it is and what it might mean to a business? Well, look, the R&D tax incentive is designed to foster innovation, and it's made, it, it is for Australian companies operating in Australia. It will help you do more R&D because essentially you're designing a product, you're going to invest a certain amount of money, but the government will come to the party and allow you to get an extra rebate. And, and the rebate can be up to 43%, depending on whether you're profitable or not profitable in the year that you claim the R&D tax incentive. It's a self-assessment system, so it's up to you to have the right documentation and supporting evidence that will support your claim. You can seek advice, as you pointed out in episode 19, from a tax consultant who will help you write up your submission and lodge that registration for you. Essentially, you then get a number sent to you that you then include in your tax return, which will give you a rebate. The R&D tax incentive is really designed for high innovation not just novel things, but high innovation. So essentially you have to be generating new knowledge. That knowledge has to require experimentation in order to prove that it, it's been generated and you have to be taking a risk. So there has to be significant or substantial risk in the project. And is that um, the risk financial? Uh, the risk is financial, yeah. It, it's as a risk of failure. In essence, if you go through those again, the idea that it has to be new knowledge means that you can't find out the information anywhere in the world. And that's literally anywhere in the world, except that the new knowledge that you're trying to generate could be known by someone else that you don't have access to. But if you could reasonably gain access to that knowledge, then it's not new knowledge. It has to be experimental in nature in that you have to formulate a hypothesis of what you're going to design and achieve. And that 
hypothesis needs to require experimentation, which means you have to try different ways of achieving that hypothesis in order to get the outcome. If you try a way of doing it and it, you succeed first time, then it's likely not R&D in the sense of the Oz industry definition of R&D mm -hmm. because you haven't had to experiment to get the, the outcome. And then finally, there needs to be a risk. And risk is really the risk of successfully getting an outcome. Now, whether you successfully achieve your hypothesis or don't doesn't matter. The fact that you did the R&D, you did the experimentation, and fail to meet the hypothesis still means it's claimable. So it's encouraging businesses in Australia to undertake novel development of products. And the products can be a range of different things. They can be a, a device, a process, a service, or some software. What needs to be done is you need to carefully break that product down into core and supporting R&D. And that's another essential element. What does that mean there, George? So core versus supporting. So let's talk a little bit about that in terms of the R&D side. Yeah, so as, as we talked about, the new knowledge and the experimentation applies to the core R&D. So let's say you're developing a widget and this widget is going to be manufactured and sold around the world. Mm -hmm. And the widget has to perform a certain function for the, for the customer that purchases it. The widget has a component of it that no one else has. That component is what is the core R&D. So only that part needs to generate new knowledge in order to produce that. Uh, you needed to do experimentation to, to achieve that. Now, it's only going to be a percentage of the overall R&D that you're doing. Surrounding that core R&D will be a, a, a portion of supporting R&D that's necessary in order for you to be able to do those experiments. So, for example, the widget may not work without the casing and the, and the mechanical structure around it in the, in the case of a product, mm. a physical product. Uh, in the case of software, it could be an algorithm, and that algorithm is, in fact, the core R&D. Mm -hmm. And around it is a whole application that needs to be there in order to support the testing and experimentation on that core R&D. This distinction is extremely important because where a lot of companies have had problems in the last three to five years has been that they have not separated their core from supporting. And therefore, when they go to have to substantiate their claim, they get caught out by the fact that they've claimed all of it. And it may all have been able to be claimed, mm -hmm. but they haven't separated core from supporting and treated everything as core and basically uh, not adhere to the legislation. Yeah, it makes sense. So what you, to summarize that there, basically core is really that unknown, that's that testing, that's the hypothesis that you're trying to prove, but you may need a shell around it to actually action it. So in the case of software, it could be an algorithm or a, a piece of AI that does X, Y, Z, but then in reality, we need all this other infrastructure or platform around it to gather the data to the user interface, and that would be supporting, I would imagine. That's correct. And, and writing it up correctly with mm -hmm. the right documentation is important to yep. justify the core R&D as mm -hmm. being core. Uh, mm -hmm. So why is it core? Why is it new knowledge? Why does it require experimentation and all of that? And then separating out the supporting R&D and then writing that up just to justify why it's required in order to carry, carry out the R&D. Now, if, if done carefully, it can substantiate a significant portion of, say, a software project or an or a product R and D, mm. because the core R and D can be, you know, one item or five items or ten items or sub items of the product mm -hmm. that are really, really the 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 unknown. And that having those and drilling down into those unknowns and documenting them then allows you to to support to substantiate the supporting R and D as claimable as well. Um, so. Uh, a good portion of your product R&D could become fully claimable. So you can claim the supporting component then if that's what you're saying, right? So your core yes. component might be only 5% of the whole application, for example, because mm -hmm. that's where the unknown is, but the supporting yeah. might be 95% of it and the whole lot is claimable in that instance? Look, you would probably say that there are three parts to a software application. So if we focus on mm -hmm. software, yeah, there's sure. your, your core R&D, which is where you're really having an unknown. It could be an algorithm, an integration, a means to achieving the some unique feature of that software. Mm -hmm. That's your core. And as you said, that could be 5%, 10% of the overall R&D. Then there's a portion 
that is the supporting R&D. So that's R&D that has to be done in order for you to be able to undertake that experiment, the experiments to prove that core R&D is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Okay. That will range from somewhere from uh, 95, as you pointed out, but more likely, you know, it'll be some other percentage between mm-hmm. the 5%, which was the core, mm-hmm. and the 95. So let's say in, a, in our example, it's another 70% of the project, and then you've got an el- eligible portion, 30% of, of the project. And that 30% is likely to be bug fixes. It could be some kind of ancillary. They call it routine software development. So setting up your dev chain, for example, and your and your DevOps is probably not supporting R&D. Oh, okay, uh, get it. But the software itself, the writing of the software mm-hmm. is supporting R&D around that in, in order to test us the, the core R&D. It's that kind of distinction that needs to be drawn. Mm-hmm. In, in addition to core R&D and supporting R&D, there are also supporting activities that the business is undertaking. So in order to have that R&D team working within the business, there are supporting activities such as finance, HR, uh, insurances, rent, etc. Those supporting activities can also be quantified and claimed as well. Okay, so there's everything supporting the product, the people that are there within the, the context of the R&D that are actually working on the project itself. Yeah. Okay, so there's a yeah. bit there for people to think about, but just the in how it all sits is there's a core component, which is what we don't know we're doing. We're learning, we're testing. It's still scientific, right? So it's, there's a whole hypothesis. There's a lot of unknowns and we're testing through that. And then around that, we've got all the supporting activities, probably likely going to be more in a, in a space of software. If you were... Um, doing a, I don't know, a medical device or a drug in that instance, maybe more of it might be cool, but it just depends on how it all is structured, I would imagine. Yeah. And I guess the the templates that I provide that take you through the, the thought process of, okay. of, of determining your core R&D and your supporting R&D and mm-hmm. supporting activities, making you consider all of that, documenting uh, how you arrived at the fact that is new knowledge. And it's it's really important that people take the documentation process and embed it into the way they think about their R&D, which is what, basically what I help them do. Okay. Because you want to make sure that you're capturing this information at the time when you're thinking about it in reality. you know, Because three years later, when you get audited, it's very, very hard to go and find the documentation. Uh-huh. So if somebody audits you, say it's Oz Industry, they want to audit you about your R&D three years ago. And they ask you, how did you determine that this core R&D was in fact eligible? You need to be able to put your finger on on the information to do with that very quickly. And you need to be able to substantiate that at that time, you searched Google, you searched university papers, you searched GitHub, you searched uh, SourceForge, you searched the various different places you could search to find out if anybody has overlapped with what you're proposing to be new knowledge at that time. So you have to have the records that you you did that at the time because if you now do the searches in 2021, mm-hmm. it may find that yeah, you you may find the answer on the internet, in which case it's impossible to substantiate that you couldn't find it back then. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, so keeping track of what you researched in the space and the problem we're trying to solve, what might be core. Cool. Let's talk a bit about process because one of the things that you've you've mentioned is how do we optimize process within an R and D claim or within tracking and monitoring R&D. So what are some of the, the things that people need to think about when even considering venturing down and doing an R&D claim? Yeah, look, uh, I guess the uh, Oz industry have guidance and essentially what we've done is we've mapped that guidance into a series of templates mm-hmm. uh, that help you by following those templates and using them for each project, you essentially create a situation where you automatically do the documentation. But essentially, it starts from the product strategy, having a product strategy document that has a roadmap of project for your product and therefore shows that those projects were being undertaken as part of a product strategy. Therefore, they are being thought of and invested in. And then those projects have to be fleshed out uh, with their core and supporting activities, as we talked about before. Mm -hmm. And then those core activities justified as being new knowledge. There needs to be plans and budgets and things like that around it. All the things that you would normally do, but they just need to be documented in a way that is consistent so that you can quickly locate that information down the track. Okay. The projects then 
have their experiment plans done in mm -hmm. test cases in a software perspective, but these are not the test cases that are run, say, for example, during an agile sprint. These are the test cases that are run when the hypothesis is being tested. Yeah, uh, is so it actually each, delivering on the outcome you're expecting. Yeah, so you know, for software, that could be that you you set out a project and you've got a hypothesis and, and there's a core R&D in there that you're, you're doing, uh, but it could take five sprints before you can undertake the test that is going to measure against that hypothesis and then another series of sprints to change it and find a new way of doing it and then uh, or optimizing it and then redoing that that experiment so the, we in software it's the, it's a little bit i guess important to separate the idea of agile development from the iterations or the systematic progression as they call it that is required by the R&D legislation, which is basically saying you have a hypothesis, you undertake a scientific process of developing something that should meet the hypothesis, and then you experiment to see if it does. That cycle is not your agile sprint cycle. It's, it's a higher level cycle that is checking your software at certain points in its development to see if it's meeting the hypothesis. And so that process needs to be well thought out and embedded into your into the way you do your R&D uh, to make sure that you are documenting your experiments and then carrying out those experiments, keeping the results, checking those results and comparing them to the hypothesis that was back in the core R&D. What was the core R&D's hypothesis? Making sure that you are comparing against that and then iterating at that higher level, then making changes to the hypothesis, making changes to the core R&D, redeveloping it, be it a a new injection mold or a new software, whatever it is at the, for the product, and then coming back and doing those experiments again. Having that as part of the way you do your R&D is really important. And it's not onerous because most people wouldn't undertake an R&D without having a product strategy. It's just writing it down and making sure it's, it's in one. Of, we provide five templates that people fill out at various points in the process. That just helps make sure that you can locate the information later on and that you've got your process well-oiled and everybody understands why they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it's peace of mind from both, if you're investing hard-earned money, you know, in R&D, you're investing previous profits to, to try and develop a new product. You want to make sure you're making the most of it. And generally speaking, the R&D legislation calls for a process that is state-of-the-art. It's the way that you can make sure that you're uh, best spending the money that you, you are investing. That's a, that's a good summation there. And one of the, the key takeaways for me was um, peace of mind. Like, yes, you do need peace of mind because you are applying for something and you're stating that you actually have tested your core product. But I think one of the things that really stood out for me during that, that description was you're developing a product and then you're testing against the objective. So in reality, if we're developing anything new, we've got an outcome we're trying to serve or a problem we're trying to solve. So we should always be reflecting on is it achieving the outcomes anyway? Yeah, so that should be really relevant. It's just writing down what the outcomes were at the time, I would imagine, is what people might fall short on. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's, the, it's a situation where if you're going to put in a tax claim, you can imagine that if you were doing your tax return, without having kept the done all the bookkeeping, you know, without all the receipts and, and the bookkeeping, you wouldn't do that. So the R&D tax incentive, it's the same thing. You wouldn't put in a claim for the tax incentive if you haven't kept all the right records. And really, the right records are not that onerous when someone with experience in doing it has fashioned uh, a series of templates that you just adhere to and follow that process. Um, I'm not going to say it's cookie cutter because we do tailor the process and fit it into your particular way of doing R&D, but essentially there's a methodology there that is, is proven to, to generate the correct records and uh, stand the test of uh, an audit. Yeah, it's worth following the templates or investigating and finding someone who can help you with this because you don't want to go through all this, like you said, invest your own money into it and then have be audited and have it rejected or have it rejected. There's no, what's the point? That's You're exactly right. all the benefit for, no, for nothing. Yeah, and I think the training or some kind of uh, workshops that will help you get to know what the real essence of the R&D tax incentive is and how you can fit that into your processes 
And that's ex- essentially the um, training workshops that we provide uh, is to help people do that. From a, um, a record keeping perspective too, you would imagine there's, there, there's obviously time allocations to this. This is probably generally what people are doing within business anyway, if you invest in people's time, but not all do. So how would you speak to that in terms of how do you allocate how much time, energy and budget has gone into a project and how might you track that? Um, look, the, the way costs are tracked is very specific to the structure of your particular business. So for example, but I'll give you the top two examples. In a situation where there's a dedicated team of people doing R&D, ideally there might be a dedicated group of people that work on the core R&D and a dedicated group of people that are working on the supporting R&D. But if, if the boundaries there aren't exact, you can at least justify the period of time that someone was working on core R&D. Then you can do a macro level, staff level apportionment is what I call it, of the, the staff costs. On the other hand, if you have a team of people that, that work on a whole variety of different things and sometimes are working on core R&D uh, and on, in the same day may not be working on core R&D or in the same week, then a time sheeting system is likely to be needed because you can't really just do an apportionment. So if you think about that at the time tracking perspective, you have the apportionment method and the timesheet method. And it really depends on how your staff allocation is done. So for example, if you were developing a particular product and you had a team that do finite element analysis, one or two people, whenever they're doing finite element analysis, they're doing R&D and it's 90% of what they do, then you can use the apportionment method to capture their costs. But on the other hand, if those people that do the finite element analysis are also the people that keep the production line running, uh, you can't do that because you, you're not going to be able to justify the exact apportionment without some kind of records as to how long they were spending doing the R&D. Yes, that's the time tracking then will record to the minute or in five, 10 minute increments, for example, how much time they actually spend. Yeah, look, it, it, it doesn't have to be that precise, but it needs to be methodical, routine. So it has to be done all the time and so shows the apportionment using the timesheet system that's correct and for all this uh tracking of the the data that you need to record and your time tracking it's best to do it as you're doing the tasks rather than just before you have to submit your claim i'm guessing yeah yeah look and you know and there's techniques that can be used for doing that for example if you were doing software development and you were using jira for example uh, or team foundation services or whatever it is those systems purposely provide mechanisms that allow you to take a ticket that you're working on, indicate that you're working on it, and then when you've spent time on that ticket, booking your time against the ticket. Uh, So now what you've got is a perfect, that would be the ideal way of doing it. I mean, not every software team would want to get to that level, but that would be the ideal outcome because now each ticket is can be classified as core or supporting, and then the developers are putting their time against the ticket. And they, these tools provide me- means of producing timesheet data from those time allocations. So that could be one way to solve the problem. And we look at different ways to solve the problem in, in, in each business that we help that undertake the training. That's right. Yeah, that's uh, important to understand that you need to get to that level consistently and be able to do it throughout the entire process. Yes, consist- it's, the name of the game is consistency. And so one of the things that, Oz industry promotes is the idea of having an R&D manual, which we we help you put in place if you'd like us to. But basically what an R&D manual is, and this is something that as a business you could take away from this podcast and, and look at putting in place, is that you need to have a written procedure on how you do your R&D, how you do your cost tracking, how you do your record keeping, so that if you do get audited or in the normal course of events, people come and go from the company, your method for doing the R&D is consistent from year to year. And that's important because if you're going back several years to look up information to answer a question from Oz Industry, you want to be able to find it consistently. You, you don't want to be trying to second guess how that person may have done it five years ago in a different folder structure. You want to have a, you know, because you could, you, could, you could spend days looking for a document and not find it, which would be you know, pretty bad in an audit situation. So by having that consistency, you can make sure that you'll be able to find the information when you need it. 
everybody knows why they're producing the information and, and they know where to put it. And that can be as simple as a folder structure, but it, if, if you write down how you're going to do it, then you can always do it and, and audit against it, uh, just like any other quality system. The R&D process needs to be uh, part of your ISO 9001 system if, uh, if you're ISO certified and therefore audited periodically to make sure that um, it's being uh, adhered to. There's a, there's a bit of information there, but in reality, it's a, it's a process, it's a document, and it's time tracking and breaking it up into core and supporting activities. So there, there isn't much there, but you still have to prove that your core activity is um, basically something new and innovative. One would, that's, that's the key pivotal point here. So if I'm in a, a business or in a startup world or whatever it might be, looking to build some software, what would be step one if I heard about R&D tax incentive, maybe I heard about it on this podcast, what should I look at to see if what I'm working on could be claimable or how I might test uh, the boundaries of what we're doing to maybe do something that's a bit more um, innovative in the space? What should I be considering there? Yeah, look, um, at, at the first level of, or of going back to first principles at the start of an R&D project, you would need to go back to what the three three core things we talked about at the beginning, which is where in this pro, in this development, this product development, am I going to generate new knowledge? Uh, so what is the new thing that's being generated here? Checking to see that it is new, making sure that it's something that's going to require experimentation and something that is risky in that you're taking a risk. And the entity taking the risk is the entity that can put the claim in. So that's why the risk test is important. So as a startup, you would look at your reason for developing this product. Obviously, as a startup, you wouldn't be undertaking the development if it wasn't something new or different or an improvement on something done previously. But you need to flesh out or tease out, if you like, of the overall work program that you're going to undertake, the part of it that is, in fact, the new knowledge. So sometimes that's an integration. Sometimes that's an algorithm. It can be a variety of different things, but they're, they're the two main areas to focus on is finding that algorithm. An algorithm can be, you know, it's a loose word. It, it doesn't have to be a mathematical algorithm. It can be a process algorithm, but you're, it's something you're going to have to iterate over to or through experimentation, determine the best way of doing it. And then that experimentation, when I say the best way of doing it, could be optimization. The speed of an integration, for example, is too slow the first time or needs to be faster, needs to be transferring different data. You discover that it needs to do something extra. That's all from the experimentation. But you've got to have that core R&D identified. And then you build on that to find all the supporting R&D that you can justify as part of the, that's needed in order to test that core R&D. And you build on that in your documentation to the point where you can justify, you know, whatever the percentage is, let's say 80 or 90% of what you're going to be spending. Then you look at all the supporting activities around that. So how much time is being spent doing product strategy right through to the finance and portioning all of that time as well. Because R&D starts, and this is probably a good segue to that, R&D starts when the product is being conceptualized. That's why the product strategy is the first document. And the product, everything from the time the, the idea is first conceptualized right through to the time the experimentation ends and the hypothesis has been met or disproven, that is all R&D. And they don't even have to occur in the same financial year. You can be doing the product strategy in this financial year but not start the actual development until next financial year. But as long as you show that that is a contiguous project, it's uh, part of the R&D claim. Oh, George, I think that's um, a really good summation. And to anyone listening to this episode, it's R and D claim can make a big difference to a business and a startup or whatever it might be, because it can allow you to continually get more runway within the product development stream. So, this this topic is quite important to anyone that's listening out there that might be developing something new and innovative or thinking about it. But definitely something worth investigating. Now, George. If anyone wants to contact you just to talk through what the processes might be, how they might structure themselves up for an R&D claim and maybe things to consider, how might they get in touch? Uh, look, I think the easiest way is to email me. It's uh, george at softlogicsolutions.com.au or just find me on 0403 398 807. 
Thanks, George. I appreciate your time today. Um, and thanks for joining us on the DevReady podcast, talking about all things R&D and how one might be able to set up their processes to make sure they're claimable. So thanks for your time. Yeah, and check out the links in the show notes once we post Thank them. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, cheers, George. Thanks. Thanks, George. Thanks.